In the book of Samuel, uh, as a young boy, Samuel, this familiar story you may have heard in Sunday school, Samuel hears a voice while he's sleeping, and he goes running to Eli, and he says, yes, master, what do you, just, what do you want? And Eli looks at him and says, it wasn't me, I didn't call you. And Samuel goes back, and he falls asleep, and this voice calls him again. He goes running back to Eli, and Eli says, I didn't call you. Goes back. And finally, Eli says, listen, it's not me. It must be God. You need to listen. And so the next time it occurs, Samuel says, Lord, here I am. I'm ready to listen. Lord, here I am. Speak, O Lord. Your servant is listening. And so in some ways, carrying on that thought from, uh, from what Nick and, and Cheryl then sang, let, let, let's just pray, and then we're going to look at, at what we can in First Samuel. Lord, I ask that you would speak to us. Lord, Lord, we always want to be guided by your word. And uh, Lord, even as we look as leaders and look to what you have for us, Lord, we want to be trusting you, walking by faith, not running ahead, not lagging behind, but walking closely with you, listening to your voice and how you're leading us. And Lord, as we come now to this, this time that you've given us, Lord, I pray that you speak to us. Lord, use the, the brief time in your word even to encourage us and to challenge us this morning. And Lord, in some way, shows Christ, for we ask it in his name. Amen. In some ways, um, when we look at 1 Samuel, understand that 1 Samuel uh, is attributed to Samuel. You know, we're there because we're looking at one book a week. This is getting to be really hard. And you get these long narrative books. But... uh, Attributed to Samuel, but Samuel obviously didn't write everything in it because it even records his death. So somebody else helped write the book of 1 Samuel. But when usually when 1 Samuel is looked at, it's looked at in conjunction with 2 Samuel. And so in our English Bible, you have 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, but in other Bibles, sometimes you'll see them put together as the book of Samuel. They're not seen as two separate books. They're seen as one book, okay? And they really center on three personalities, Obviously, Samuel is one, second is Saul, and the third is David. If, if you were outlining 1 Samuel, it would go something like this. It would say chapters 1 through 8, primarily Samuel. Chapters 9 through 15, primarily Saul. Chapters 16 to 31, you have that transition, Saul to David, and then 2 Samuel is all about David. Okay? Now, the thing that you want to keep in mind, remember, is we're piecing this together and we're saying, look, the Bible is 66 books written by 40 authors over 1,500 years, but but it is one unit of thought. There's there's a line that runs through it. And so there's a cohesiveness, a unity in the Bible. And so how does 1 Samuel fit to, to where it is in the Bible and its timing? It follows Judges. Now, I know after Judges, we did Ruth, because Ruth is written and is a story about the time of the Judges. All right? 1 Samuel follows after Judges. In fact, Samuel is the last judge. So if you read the book of Judges and you get to the last judge, you say, oh, that's the last judge. No, it's not. Samuel is the last judge. What you find in 1 Samuel is a transition from Judges the rule over Israel by judges to now a rule by monarchs, kings. And so it serves the transition from judges to kings, to rulers, okay? And so when you keep that in mind, you have to go back to the last book, last words in the book of Judges that says something like this. There was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And that's repeated in elsewhere in the book of Judges. So what you have is there was no king in Israel, and then the book of Samuel tells us how we now move to how there is a king in Israel. Okay? So that, that's how they fit together. Now, Samuel, okay, it, it presents us with, with this marvelous tension between the sovereign purpose of God and how it plays out in human history. Uh, there's an emphasis upon the human history as you work through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, and there are times as you read through it that God seems rather conflicted. 
in this idea of his sovereignty. So it's in 1 Samuel, you'll see things like this. I regretted that I made Saul king, or God changed his mind, or God repented. Now, that doesn't mean God didn't know what was going on, or God didn't understand, God's caught off guard. God, it has nothing to do with the knowledge of God or, or, the, or God's sovereignty, okay? A denial of that. But what you see is this relationship between the sovereign purpose of God being unfolded in human history. It's kind of like a glove, okay? The, the, the glove is the human history. It's what we see and how we judge things in the movement. But really the hand that's in the, that's in the glove is what's really in control of the glove. And that's the way it is, what you see in terms of God's work throughout 1 Samuel. Our emphasis is on the idea of a king. This kingship. And when you come to this, and that last line about there was no king in Israel, what you see in 1 Samuel is this. When left to our own devices, what are the choices that we make with regards to leadership? And God reveals this through the tragic story of Saul, who when left to our own wisdom, in contrast to what God values and how he's at work in accomplishing his redemptive work through a king who is the true shepherd king, and ultimately it's not just David, but pointing us to Christ. God is at work telling us who the right king is as opposed to what we think a king is. Now, God, all the way back in Genesis, we, we dealt with the idea of a mediatorial king. Remember, God created Adam. Adam, in the image of God, is given a role as a king. He has dominion. God's sovereign. God's the sovereign ruler. He, he created it all. It all belongs to him. But he allows humans to reign on his behalf. That's what's called a mediatorial king. His, his representatives of rule. And Adam had that function. All, he had dominion over the earth. But Adam blew it. Okay, he failed. All right? I think we understand that way back when we did Genesis. God has been working to demonstrate his purposes. He still has a purpose of exercising his rule through a mediatorial king. And it doesn't just end in Adam. It doesn't end in David. It doesn't end in Israel. Even when you get to Revelation 21 and 22, we need to understand, we talk about going home. We're journeying home. Where there's home? Home is a kingdom. It's a kingdom. Our citizenship is not here. Where? Our citizenship is in heaven. If you're a citizenship, it implies kingdom. And when you get to Revelation 21 and 22, there you see the unfolding of the kingdom of God in, in perfection. And who's there? You see God and you see the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Well, he's Christ. He's Christ, the righteous King, the shepherd. And so all the way through, even when we get home, understand there's a sense of mediatorial rule exercised through Christ. And so what we see now in human perspective through Saul and David is what God is doing and demonstrating in particular in the nation of Israel, his idea of mediatorial rule. Okay? And at the core of mediatorial rule is an overriding characteristic, an outstanding characteristic that God demands, and that's righteousness. When you work through the prophets, you work through this, righteousness is the issue. Now let me put it in these terms. Character. Righteousness, at its core, righteousness is a reflection of our character. Character is the core of who we are. It's what matters. In God's eyes, it's not what we'll see on the outside, it's what's on the inside. It's our character that matters. And when, we lift, when we're left to our own devices, we look for wrong characteristics. We, we, we mistake what's important in life. You know, Dr. King really framed it right in his famous I Have a Dream speech when he said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation when they will not be judged by the color of their skin, not by the externals, but by the content of their character. 
50 years later, we still haven't got that right. The content of character. And biblically, that's what we're confronted with in 1 Samuel, is character. The character of what God considers valuable, not only in the place, in the heart of a, of a mediatorial king, but certainly in our own hearts as those made in his image. So we're not going to have time to go all the way through what I had planned. We'll, we'll save that part of it for next week. But I am going to deal with, with at least Saul this morning because Saul at least gives us the wrong perspective. Okay? Go to chapter 8 of the book of Samuel. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 8. The first thing we need to understand is there was no king in Israel and uh, every man did what was right in his own eyes. So the people said, we want a king. And, and God says, hey, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me as their king. Well, he we said, well, wait a minute. Here's one of these ideas of the conf- God being conflicted. Are, are they rejecting God as their king that they want a human king? Well, what's wrong with that? Be- certainly, look, if you go back in the Old Testament a little further, back in Genesis chapter 49, God made it clear that he intended to be a king over Israel. Because in the promise that Jacob, in the blessing of Jacob, as he's extending that to his children, he makes a prophetic statement. He says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. That that the kingly line was going to come through his son, Judah. So in in Genesis 49, you have this prophetic statement. In the law, in Deuteronomy 17, as part of the law, God gives instructions and says, look, and when you have a king, these are the rules for the king. Make sure that his heart follows wholly after my law, and he doesn't pursue wine, women, and song, and chariots, and soldiers, and money, and fame, and those are all the wrong things. Make sure he has a heart for me. So when you have a king, so in the law that Moses gave, there was already a prescription regarding a king. So when the people come and say, we want a king, it's not because God says, I had no plan for a king. He obviously had a plan for a king. What's the problem here? This is what you see in in verse 4 of chapter 8. All the the elders gathered together. They come to Samuel. They said to him, look, you've gotten old. You should have gone to the class. Your sons don't walk in in your ways. Appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. There's where the rub comes. God says down a little further, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all they save you, for they've not rejected you, they've rejected me from being king over them. And then you get a little later, and, and Samuel gives them, says, hey, when you have a king, guess what? He's going to take and take and take and take and take from you. Hmm, tax, 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 tax. Sounds familiar. Some things don't change. Nevertheless, verse 19, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. No, we we, we understand who God is, but we want a king like the nations, who will judge us like the nations, who will give us victory in our battles like the nations. That's where the rub came. They kept looking at the nations to say, we want leadership like that. We want to be judged and have judges like that. We want to have laws like them. We want a king to lead us and give us victory in battle. How how quickly have they forgotten that back in Joshua, who gives the victory in battle? God does. God is the one who goes ahead. God is the one who gives victory. And they're already looking to earthly kings in order to... That's where the rub comes. Now listen, sometimes what you see here is God gave them what they wanted. It's one of these things of this, again, this tension, this marvelous tension, that in His sovereignty, God sometimes gives us over to our desires. You see that in Romans 1, 2. And he does that to magnify himself. And he does it to demonstrate his purpose. He does it to demonstrate his excellence. So be careful what you ask for. So they wanted a king. They got it. But notice how they were judging. What was important to them. What you start to see reflected in Saul. 
chapter 9, verse 2. There was a man, he had a son, his name was Saul. A choice and handsome man, and he was, he was not a more handsome person than among the sons of... Listen, do you think David was good looking? Apparently David wasn't as good looking as Saul. Okay? David was, may have been a ruddy, handsome man, but he had nothing on Saul. And Saul stood head and shoulders above everybody else. Let me tell you, Saul was a physical specimen. I mean, ladies, this would be the guy who's like, man, this is the hunk that everybody wants. Okay? Maybe he was the mold that God had when he made Adam. Okay? He was everything that a person could look at physically and see and say, yes, that's what I want. Now, what you're going to see a little later in chapter 16 is when God starts dealing and is dealing with Saul and the transition from Saul to David and Samuel goes looking for David God says, I'm going to remind you of something I'm going to remind you chapter 16 verse 6 when they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointing is before him. Ooh, 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 Eliab's a pretty good guy. But the Lord says to Samuel, don't look at his appearance at the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. When you start judging character, what he's saying is, we easily look at the wrong things that we think will make up character. And when you start to unfold Saul and start looking at Saul, you start to see what's not on the outside, but what's on the inside in Saul. Saul was all about external appearances. Not only his own, but how he's perceived by others. So back in, over in chapter 13, and when you see where his, his Saul starts to have issues and disobey, chapter 13 and verse 11, Samuel confronts him and says, what have you done? And Saul said, well, I saw all the people leaving me. The people were leaving me. Therefore, that's what I did. You see the same thing in chapter 15. Where the people, he feared the people. And there he acted disobediently. And the irony of the end of chapter 15, after Samuel has confronted him and dealt with him, you know what he says to Samuel? Hey Samuel, before you leave, honor me before the elders. Honor me before the people. Saul is really concerned about external appearances. How people perceive him. He's more fearful of man than he is fearful of God. External things matter more when someone lacks character. In chapter 13, what you see also is an impatience. Because Samuel didn't come when Saul thought he should come or when Samuel said he was coming. And he gets impatient, and he can't wait on God, but he acts, therefore, contrary to God's command. And what's interesting is, he places the responsibility on other people. Samuel said, what have you done? He said, I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you didn't come within the appointed time. It's not my fault. You didn't come at the right time. And you know what? I chose to do what I did because the people were leaving. It's not my fault. I'm not assuming responsibility. Other people's fault. We blame others. When you want to see character flaw, when someone fails to accept responsibility for their actions and places it at the feet of somebody else, there you have a character flaw. It's not what you see on the outside. It's what you see on the inside. What you see in chapter 14 is that he rules by his own wisdom and makes some boneheaded decisions. Even impacting his own son. 
hey, you want to have an army equipped for war? The last thing you want to do is feed them, right? So he tells the army, don't, don't eat. Nobody's allowed to eat anything. Go to war. How absurd. He's spiritually deceived. Fifth, chapter 15, verse 13. God says, look, when you, when you take Agag and the Amalekites, don't spare anything. That's, I know it's a morally offensive issue, but look, don't spare anything. So what does he do? He keeps the choicest things for himself and spares Agag. And then he says, you know why I did this, Samuel? Because I want to keep the best stuff to worship God. I disobey God in order that I can worship him. That's where you see Samuel's response. Hey, to obey is better than sacrifice. You're spiritually deceived. You think these, that the, the, the sacrifice is what God's looking for. Don't you understand God is dealing with the issues of the heart and righteousness of the heart? And then what you see is this play on words that runs through this in terms of greatness, both as in terms of his stature, his physical size, but it also starts to play to character. And what you see in Saul is a false humility. What you see in Saul is, as, he, as he begins as a guy who says, I can't do this, and a guy who's hiding among the baggage, he, he says, ah, and the Spirit of God comes upon him, the Spirit of God empowers him, and, and, and he seems to be humble. But as you work through the book, what you see is it's really a false humility. What you see is a man who is marked by arrogance, a man who is marked by pride. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to stop, at least that part. Okay? We'll look at David as a contrast next week. But look, it, it's easy to jump all over Saul and jump all over leaders. But to understand that the principle of what's at our core and what's down deep matters to all of us. Okay, And there's an illustration that, that I've used, and, and uh, there's a book that I've used for a number of years, and some of you are familiar with it, and, and, uh, and for others, I'll be introducing it this way. Um, usually when I use the illustration, I use it in terms of sailboats. Okay, But I'm going to do it this way. Ready? I'm going to do it this way. Hey, it's wintertime. Wouldn't you rather be on that... Okay, on a cruise right now. Okay, Oasis of the Seas, Norwegian Cruise Lines, Oasis of the Seas. It's the largest cruise ship floating these days. Okay, let's show you how big it is. Look, look at the next one. That's it compared to a regular cruise ship. Okay, now, I've been on one of the regular ones and I thought it was big. Okay, twenty stories high. Four football fields long. Okay. Look, this ship is five times larger than the Titanic. It's larger than an aircraft carrier. Okay, this thing's big. Okay, go to the next slide. Now, you can't read all that stuff, but this is the stuff that matters most. When your travel agent is trying to sell you on this cruise, this is the kind of stuff they're telling you that's on this ship about all the dining rooms, all the spectacular dining rooms. Listen, this ship has a zoo on it. <laughs> all right? An amusement park. I mean, it's phenomenal. Okay? I don't, you know, it doesn't have one pool. It's got pools everywhere. Okay? But this thing is... It, 213 feet above the waterline. I mean, 20 stories high and all those decks and... Man... So, when they're selling this cruise, this, this is where the emphasis is. Okay? Let me tell you, this is the equivalent of the externals. Okay? Go to the next one. Because what really matters most about this ship, you see where that red line is at the bottom? That's what matters most. And when you're going to your travel agent and booking your trip, you're not asking about the red line. But that's the most important thing. Here's what I redefine it as. What's below the waterline? What's below the waterline matters more than what's above the waterline. Now, the reason I talk about this in terms of sailboats is because it's really easy to understand the keel. If this thing had a normal keel, 
that you would normally think of in terms of the draft, okay, how much water it draws in order to stay afloat, this ship couldn't enter a harbor, okay, because it would be so far down in the water. But we've learned a lot, okay? And so now the issue is not how, down, how far down it goes. Now we try to say, how does this ship stay afloat? And it's the displacement of water, okay? Archimedes' principle. So it, it has to equal the displacement of water. It has to displace as much water in terms of weight as what's above the water line. So in order for this ship to stay afloat, in order for this ship to, to cruise, it has to displace 100,000 tons of water. Now the way it does that, without being so deep, is that this ship is 66 feet wide. Okay, so it's really, really wide. This ship can't fit through the Panama Canal. Okay? 66 feet wide, and that water, below that water and that red, is 30 feet. Okay? So 30 feet, 66 feet wide, by the length of the ship, will displace 100,000 tons of water so that this ship can stay afloat. Okay? Now, I'm not telling you this so you could go book a cruise. Okay? What I'm telling you is what matters most is what's below the water line. Because I'm going to tell you what. Okay? If it wasn't, you wouldn't want to get on this boat. No matter what the entertainment is, no matter what's above the waterline, because the first little wave that you encountered would flip this boat over. So it's not only just to sail through calm seas, but when it encounters some waves, how does it stay upright? without capsizing, rolling over. How does it stay? Because of what's below the water line. What you don't see. When storms of life come, what really is going to get you through that is what's below the water line in your life. So here's the point. Saul is building his life on everything above that water line. What God says is you need to invest below the water line. The issues of the heart, the core, the habits of the heart, righteousness of the heart, the depth of your soul. What is it so when storms come and things come, what helps you navigate through them? It's what's down deep. You know, storms you can prepare for. A lot of times we know they're coming, and by the way, if a hurricane's coming, this thing looks, gets out of port and tries to head to sea, either to avoid the hurricane or ride it out as, as least minimal damage. But here's something that sailors dread. It's not the storm. It's called a rogue wave that you can't see, that you can't anticipate, that you don't know that's coming. And sometimes a rogue wave may be 100 feet tall. You want to make sure that your ship can sus sustain even through a rogue wave. Let me tell you what a rogue wave is. A rogue wave is Jen Robbins, who two weeks ago, things are sailing along pretty smooth goes to a doctor and says, breast cancer. No idea it's coming. Let me tell you what Jen's doing. You know how Jen's responding? There's one who's got some depth below the waterline. In navigating this, Jen is navigating it because of what's below the waterline in her life. A God-centered righteousness and thirsting after him. So the question for us, unlike Saul, is where are you going to invest? Where are you going to place your... What we'll do is, look, the contrast of this is David, who what? Is a man after God's own heart. So we'll look at David. What are the things that go below the waterline in our life to build that into us? You know what the best thing is? 
You know who the best king is? It's Jesus. Jesus had, had, had the stuff below the waterline, man, so that what you saw above the waterline was a true reflection of what he really was. That's why Jesus is the perfect mediatorial king, because he's the righteous shepherd that the prophets speak about. Jesus is the one who, it's not just about the externals, but you see in Jesus. That's why, that's why the writer of the Hebrews says, look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. The other guys, don't look to Abraham, Isaac, Noah, all those guys. Look to Jesus. Because Jesus has got the stuff that keeps him upright. And Jesus is the one who keeps us upright. 